If you guys want to talk about the worst mom in the history of moms, let's talk about the case of Diane Downs, who literally attempted to murder all three of her children in order to get a man to fall in love with her. So what exactly creates a monster like this? Well, Diane was born August 7th of 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona. Most of her life, she was pretty well behaved, but she started to rebel against her parents around high school. She cut her hair, had a really edgy phase, and got super boy crazy. And she started to date guys, which was way outside of her strict family's rules. And she fell in love with a boy named Steve Downs. They were high school sweethearts, but the second the college hit, they ended up going separate ways. He joined the Navy, and she went to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. And while they said that they would stay faithful to each other, she immediately started to hook up with other guys when she got there. And was expelled for her promiscuous behavior, and had to go back and live with her strict parents. While well, Steve came back, he forgave her, and they ended up running away together and getting married on November 13th of 1973. to the Diane Downs case. Well, the marriage between her and Steve was beyond rocky. And having their first daughter together, Christy, did not help that improve. And six months after she was born, Diane ended up leaving Christy with her dad so she could join the Navy, which only lasted three weeks because she had to leave for severe blisters. They had another kid in 1976 named Cheryl, and Steve had a vasectomy immediately after this, but then Diane was pregnant again. So I guess you can imagine how that happened. She did not go through with the pregnancy, but her and Steve stayed together. Later, they moved to Mesa, Arizona, got new jobs, and Diane was having affairs with all of her new co-workers. Got pregnant, again, kept this one, and had a boy named Danny. Steve actually still decided to stay for the sake of the kids, and wanted to remain a father figure to Danny. But eventually, they ended up getting divorced in 1980, and this is when things got significantly more unstable. Diane started to bounce from relationship to relationship, moving in and out with different men, and then decided to become a surrogate in order to make money, even though she didn't pass all the psychiatric exams terrifying read to the what? diane downs case so this is when diane met robert nickenbacher who went by the name nick and she swore that this man was the love of her life he had separated from his wife and describes the relationship as being intense and overwhelming he eventually broke it off with her though because he didn't like kids and this is when diane became devastated and angry at her own children for getting in the way of her love her kids and her moved to cottage grove oregon but still couldn't seem to forget nick she would obsessively write to him and she really stopped paying attention to her kids health they often went hungry went without coats in the cold it was even said by a neighbor that cheryl had mentioned that she was scared of her mom well, on Thursday, May 19th of 1983, everything went down. This story is from her perspective, by the way. They were coming home from a friend's house whenever Diane decided to take the kids on a scenic route. They did this often to explore. Hungry Like the Wolf started to play on the radio. And this is when she noticed a bushy-haired stranger signaling her over from the middle of the road. And at 10 p.m., with her kids asleep in the back of the car, she got out to talk to him, and he immediately demanded for her keys. Four to the Diane Downs case. So immediately after this stranger demanded for her keys, they had some sort of a struggle in which he shoots all three of her kids and then shoots her in the left arm. In order to distract him, she pretends to throw her keys in the bush and then uses the keys that are actually in her hand to turn on the car and then drive wildly like a lunatic to the hospital. So she pulls up to this hospital with her kids in bad condition and all of the medical professionals that were there that night were shocked by her reactions. Her daughter Cheryl ended up passing away and Danny and Christy were literally clinging to life. And she showed no emotion at all. Not only had she wrapped her own gun wound and not her kids, but she was worried about her new car having blood on it. She seemed relieved that Cheryl was dead and was shocked when she found out that Danny, her three-year-old child, had been paralyzed. And she was only shocked because he wasn't hit in the heart. Christy had had a stroke, but she was still alive. So currently, Diane was the only witness. And a lot of moms actually felt for her during this time and were even scared to leave with this man on the loose. Five to the Diane Downs case. Even though the police were already suspicious of Diane, because she was the only witness, they had to rule out her story. So they got a composite sketch of the guy and they ended up searching the whole area where they only found some bullet casings. And her interviews during this time, if you guys have ever seen them, are so weird, definitely worth watching. This woman was eating up the attention so much and she made the story into this whole overcoming thing where like she battled the patriarchy, ended up actually getting away from this man, like she's kind of the hero in the situation, but didn't show any emotion towards her kids. She went on the Oprah show and would crack jokes and have the crowd laughing. So the police ended up asking her to do a reenactment of this event. And it's truly one of the weirdest videos that you will ever see because she seems like she's having fun. Any mom being put through this would have found this to be extremely traumatic to relive this event. Instead, she's having fun, smirking, checking herself out in the car mirror, ends up hitting her arm on the steering wheel and says that almost hurt as bad as when and cuts herself off. And it seems like she was about to say to the Diane Downs case. So after seeing this horrific reenactment, people just flat out are not believing her anymore, especially whenever she said this whole thing took place in like five to 10 seconds. And she did not take the criticism very well, literally stating, if I had shot my own children, wouldn't I have done a good job of it? She's literally gaslighting people who are letting her know that things aren't adding up. 
Back at the hospital, Christy is starting to improve a lot, but she's still nonverbal. Her mom ends up coming to visit her actually and her heart spikes. So the police are starting to want to have her as a witness and they immediately get her in with a therapist. They practice by her writing down the shooter on a piece of paper and her throwing it into a fire until eventually she feels safe enough to give it to the therapist. And once she did, it said her mom. The police went to go check Diane's house, found bullet casings that matched those at the crime scene, and also found a diary with intros about Robert and talking about how Robert doesn't want kids. So then the police had their motive, which Oprah even brought up to her that the man was now afraid of her because he thought she had shot her own kids. She tried to change her story a few more times, but she ended up getting arrested. Part seven to the Diane Downs case. So by the time it was time for her trial, she was pregnant again. She said she did it because she missed her kids and was lonely. But honestly, I feel like she did it just because she thought her sentence wouldn't be as bad. They ended up playing the song Hungry Like the Wolf in the courtroom and Diane was jamming out to it. They showed the tapes and she showed no emotion. They even did a doll reenactment for the jury to paint a picture. And then Christy testified, saying that her mom had actually stopped the car when she thought they were all asleep, went to the trunk, came around, and ended up shooting them. Cheryl first, Danny second, and her last. Wrapped herself in a towel and proceeded to drive slowly to the hospital. So ultimately, Diane was found guilty. And to this day, she is still in complete denial, thinking that she is still innocent. She ended up having the baby girl in jail and she was immediately taken from her. This daughter was adopted and Danny and Christy were actually adopted by one of the prosecutors on the case. Overall, it was a pretty happy ending. But Diane actually successfully broke out of jail for a little bit. If you want to hear that story, come over to my Instagram. It'll be on my middle reels tab. Imagine TikTok being so powerful that they actually help you identify the person that almost murdered you. On my For You page the other day, I found this viral video that you guys might recognize, which states videos I took before almost being hunted and murdered. I clicked on her page, listened to her story, and was like, I have to know more. So I reached out and got the full thing. This is the case of Flowers Don't Growl. April 29th through April 30th of 2019, Taylor and her boyfriend Chris decided to take a trip to Falls Creek Falls, Tennessee. Taylor was five months pregnant at the time, so they figured they needed one last little trip before they were going to have a baby. And Taylor swore that Chris was going to propose. So that's why she documented so much of this trip, not even realizing that later on it was going to be used as evidence. So they set up at their assigned camping lot. They spent their time hiking, exploring, having fun. Taylor would collect flowers along the way to document it for memory's sake. But please keep these flowers in mind. And then on the second day, everyone from their assigned area was gone except for them. So they were more alone than before, or so they thought. Welcome back to part two of Flowers Don't Growl. So later in the night on their last day, they ended up hearing a loud crash. There's very windy roads nearby, so they figured that it was a wreck. And just to make sure kids weren't involved and that everyone was safe, they got out of their tent and ran over to the crash site, which was maybe half a mile away to go check on the people. The sheriff ends up showing up and it's like a DUI situation, but everyone ultimately was okay. So before heading back to their campsite, Taylor says she has to go use the restroom. So her and Chris walk over to the bathroom so she can do her thing. And in the distance, they see a light flickering. And as it gets closer, they notice that someone is running with a flashlight. So they're both cracking jokes to each other like, oh my gosh, this guy really has to go to the bathroom. But once he approaches the restroom, he ends up stopping right at them instead of actually going into the bathroom. And states, and I quote, wow, you guys are fast. Creepy. Taylor notices that he has a weird smile on his face and feels really nauseous but just associates it with the pregnancy. So just to be nice, they continue to have a conversation with him. But ultimately, this is where things go wrong. on flowers don't growl. So Chris and Taylor continue their weird interaction with this man. Chris explaining that they got to the wreck fast because they wanted to make sure everyone was okay. And the guy goes, yeah, I guess I'm just used to it. And Taylor's confused because like, used to what? Hikes? Car wrecks? They ask what he does and he says he travels a lot and likes to go camping. And Taylor, starting to get very uncomfortable now, tells Chris that, hey, they need to go back to the campsite because the police will be over there waiting for their statements. Just trying to make an excuse to leave and Chris could tell it was BS. And as they start to take steps back, he starts to take steps towards them, asking questions like, hey, how long are you guys going to be here for? And his hand kept playing with his hoodie pocket. Chris was starting to pick up on the message as they continued to walk backwards while the man followed them forward. And then this guy decides to tell them a little story. He was like, car accident. It got me thinking this morning as I was hiking and I passed these flowers. I stopped because they were so beautiful and I heard a deep growl and it scared me. And it makes me think, you know, you never know what day is going to be your last. That's when they saw the flowers don't growl. So this is when Taylor noticed the outline in his hoodie pocket was the shape of a knife. It completely clicked for her and she told her husband that they needed to run. He looked at her like, what's going on? And she just states, flowers don't growl. So they took off running and this is when he took off chasing them. And I'll show a map of where exactly they were chased. This is where Taylor and Chris ended up and this is where they last saw the guy chasing them. And they made it all the way back to the crash site and luckily the police were still there. They told them what happened and made a report. 
and two of the cops went out looking for him but couldn't find him anywhere, while the other officer accompanied them back to the campsite so that they could pack up their stuff and leave. They tried to get updated on their case later on, but never ever got an update. Having the baby and it being a couple years later, Taylor sits down and ends up making a TikTok. It goes viral and a bunch of people start to DM her with potential suspects. Taylor stopped looking at her DMs because it got so emotional, but one user that messaged her lived in the Falls Creek Falls area and had followed a particular case. She opened the DM and saw the man. This is James L. Jordan. Fathers don't growl part five. So Taylor immediately recognized James L. Jordan as being the person that tried to attack her and her now husband that night. And horrifyingly enough, he ended up killing two weeks later, stabbing one female victim that did survive, but stabbing the male to death. The male victim ended up sending out an SOS last minute before he passed, and the police came to arrest Jordan. And honestly, one of the worst things was that he was not found guilty by reason of insanity. And Taylor has tried to reach out to police multiple times because he was very calm and collected the night that her and her husband survived. She has scoured all of her photos trying to figure out where he was at and found out that he was staying back here outside of the regular lots. Followers have pointed out things like this creepy shadow in this video, but ultimately, we don't really know where he was at. But because of the story that he told about the flowers... She thinks that he had been stalking them for a while, watching her pick them. Taylor now is using her page to promote safety, learning how to protect yourself and carrying items such as mace or a taser, and campsites where you pay to camp probably should have security. Taylor is tagged below, so please go follow her to keep up with her story.